Dear Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we're thankful for the ministry of music and for the sweet, soothing influence that your spirit brings. We thank you for your blessings. And Lord, it seems to me in my mind that there are people here today who need heart healing, mind healing, and spiritual healing, Lord. And I just want to lift up those who may have a need today, that you please be with them and that the arms of Christ, Jesus, our Savior, will be very near and dear and around them during this time of their lives. <clears throat> I just have a sense, Lord, that there are some, those who have been... Um, fragile during the Sabbath, and I want to pray that you bless and encourage them in a special way. Father, we're thankful for your love and kindness and that you desire to draw near to us. You've told us that we can cast all of our care upon you, for you care for us. And I pray that you would help us to remember that Jesus is ever near. Father, as we prepare to con continue our lectures now and <clears throat> go into our study this afternoon, I pray that you please once again, pour out your Spirit upon us. Grace us with the presence of your Spirit. We want the sprinkling of the latter rain. That we can be able to have open minds to understand and comprehend truth and to produce fruit in our characters and lives. Forgive us of our sins. Wash us clean with your blood, we pray. And bless us and give me, I pray, strength and energy. Please help my words, my voice to be strong. And Father, I pray that you take full control of these lectures and full control of my heart and mind. And please speak clearly to our, our hearts. We thank you, Father, for your blessings. Please bless your word as we study now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And we claim these things. Amen. Once again, just a brief announcement in case anybody's here who was not here before. Um, our website is right here up, up here on the board. You'd like to be able to go there. And we have, uh, by the way, we have uh, free audio and deep, uh, uh, video that you can just download for free if you like and free resources and things like that. Um, so we hope that you enjoy uh, accessing that. We also, once again, have a camp meeting coming up right here in Oregon in September. Hope that uh, hope that all of you will choose to come on down and be a part of it. I know I've seen a, a lot of you at our, my camp meetings before, and I'm hoping to get more and more to come in fellowship. They're really a high point of the year. At least for me, they are. It's just, they're just such a blessing. Um, there's something about having several brethren in one place, um, communicating light to us, and then multitudes of other brethren who love to study and also share and share the things that God has been doing with them and also sharing with them. And it just seems like these camp meetings are just an, uh, an accumulation of light that uh, always something new comes out of these camp meetings every single time and almost makes me feel like not missing any of them. Otherwise, I feel like I'm lagging behind. So, has anyone experienced that? Like I've experienced it? It seems like you miss one camp meeting and people come back and say, oh, ooh, wow, wow. Tell me what I miss, what I miss. Yeah. And it's just some new beautiful truth that just keeps on confirming. I'll tell you, <laughs> last year, some of us brethren were uh, sitting around and discussing some things. And even as we were just discussing it last year, and just among ourselves, and just some new beautiful truths were coming out. And, and just one brother there said, uh, said to us, and I'll never forget by his grace, by God's grace, I'll never forget his words. And he says, he kind of, we all chuckled and said, this is such, so beautiful. And he says, you know, he says, uh, if all this is darkness, like we're accused of it being, this is some beautiful darkness. <laughs> and I'll tell you, it's about that simple. You know, there's so much truth and beauty and light in the third angel's message. And in the fourth angel that comes down, I mean, it's just, uh, just mind-blowing. And, and then when I see you know, people fight against it, I say, you know, that's pride, prejudice, and just a lack of study. That's really all it is. And we need to pray for our brethren. But I'll tell you, I would encourage you to come on out. It's going to be a blessing once again this year in September. And again, we have another one in Idaho. And I hope to meet some new friends from the, North, the Newport area and Sandpoint area and people from Idaho. And really, we're designing to put this one on in Idaho for uh, the people in that area. We want people to be encouraged who are closer, who can come on down. 
uh, so people can meet each other and recognize they're not a, just a, sh uh, a ship out to sea by themselves drifting. So let's pray for those camp meetings. We have a lot of other things coming up as well. Um, please keep uh, our ministry in your prayers as a lot of opportunities have opened up for us. God bless you. It's good to meet both of you. Take care. Stay in touch. And uh, for, for me, it's been really amazing. Um, I have been understanding these things for just the last uh, less, than, less than three years. Um, before that time, I was involved in doing full-time ministry, and I, I pastored now uh, four churches. Um, and I've been involved in ministry before that as, as an elder in a couple different conferences for several years. And so, although I'm a young man, I've been involved in ministry still for a little bit of time, probably about the last 14 years. And yet, just within the last three years of doing um, ministry, I'll tell you, I, I've never had so many doors open in so uh, quick a manner as it is in connected with sharing these truths of the world. I've never experienced this before in, in my Christian experience. Um, not only has the year 2012 was already booked for me last year when I was still in Europe, and now all of 2013 is completely booked as well. And I think we have like eight countries just for 2013 that we're supposed to be going to. And I had to turn down things because I just, I'm, not a, I'm not a robot. I'm, I'll die. I have a family too. I mean, <clears throat> I have to rest sometimes. And so it's just, um, and it's really amazing. It just shows me that the, the, the harvest is great and the labors are few. And we need to pray the Lord of the harvest that he would raise up other people, other faithful watchmen to be able to give the message to the world. And this, by and large, this is a lay movement, brothers and sisters. And we need to recognize that we all have an individual responsibility to communicate light and truth with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? <clears throat> the Lord needs more people, friends. Uh, you know, in William Miller's day, we believe Millerite history is being repeated. In Miller's day, there were 300 Millerite preachers. That's why there were 300 1843 charts lithographed so that each Millerite preacher could have a chart as they went and preached. And I oftentimes wonder, where are those 300 preachers today? And I know there's quite a few <coughs> people that we don't consider main preachers, uh, but I know personally there are people all over the world that are still speaking and standing up. But we need more. We need more people to have, so we can present a united front. What's that? <coughs> there were about 1,000 over there in England with Edward Irving and so forth, but just right here in North America, was, there was 300 Millerite preachers. So we need more Millerite preachers, amen? So start studying, stand up, and share the Word of God. So let's go ahead and go into the daily. Um, I'm going to invite us um, to open our Bibles as we've already opened in prayer. We've already prayed and asked the Lord to be with us. So I'm going to ask us to open our Bibles to the book of Daniel chapter 8 as we discuss the, the daily. <clears throat> now one thing we know, one thing we know from this quote right here, even though this quote does not specifically describe what the daily is, what do we know from this quote? What is the one thing that we can ascertain from this quote? Even though it does not tell us what it is, the subject of the daily is? The word sacrifice. Okay, yes, the word sacrifice, so we know that. I'm looking for something else that is more uh, qualitative of what we're about to share. Okay, so what we do know is that those who gave the judgment hour cry had the correct view. So although we don't know from this quote alone what it is, we can deduce from this very clear sentence right here that the Lord gave the correct view of it to those who gave the judgment hour cry. All we then have to do is then go find out what the people taught before 1844 who gave the judgment hour cry. Correct? So it's a pretty simple... Uh, you don't have to be a, a sleuth or a detective or something to find this out. It's pretty, pretty easy. Now, I actually had somebody tell me, this was last year, we had a, a special meeting, myself and two of our brethren, uh, uh, who are also speakers of, these, of, this, of this message. Uh, we had a, a sit-down meeting, and I, I've talked to some of you before about this. I'm, I'm abstaining from sharing names just because it'll be recorded and so forth. Um, and we had a sit-down meeting with some, some uh, different lights in Adventism, and in this uh, meeting, one of the gentlemen actually brought up the argument about this quote, and he said, well, the issue, she's not talking about that they had the correct view of the daily. This is what they, this person told us in this meeting, the six-and-a-half-hour meeting, and we, the daily was one of the subjects that we talked about. And this gentleman uh, shared his understanding that 
He said that, well, Ellen White was not saying that they had the correct view of the daily, but that they had the correct view that the word sacrifice was supplied. This was the argument, okay? Did you get that? So, so in other words, what he was doing was he was leaving an open door for a different view of the daily. That They just had the correct view that the word sacrifice was supplied. And as I thought about that, I said, well, you know, that's not very honest. The reason why is because if we simply go to what these gentlemen taught in the, who had the correct view. Let's go ahead and actually look at that. <clears throat> Let's find out and see. Let's see. Let's go ahead and look in here real quick. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to open this up real quick. This is just has some pioneer quotations. So as we look at this correct view of the daily, <clears throat> I want to see what they say. All right, so let's look at some of the people that had the correct view of the daily that gave the judgment hour cry. So once again, this argument was that they only had the correct view about the word sacrifice being supplied, but the daily was open to interpretation. That is being dishonest. It's not, it's not true. It's disingenuous. Because when you actually read what the pioneers say, <clears throat> we'll go past William Miller right now for a minute, and what they say about the word sacrifice being supplied they connect it with the true interpretation of the daily. All right? Are you all, are you all with me? Am I? Okay. I know it's been a long day. You're not all tired too much, are you? Okay. So I'm just making sure. All right. <clears throat> so let's find out. Now, Josiah Litch. Was Josiah Litch part of the group of men that gave the judgment hour cry? Absolutely. Matter of fact, he did not go through the disappointment successfully. Uh, he became one of the first day Adventists along with Joshua Himes. Jo Josiah Litch, unfortunately, was one of the men uh, who... Uh, influenced William Miller against the Sabbath truth. So Josiah Litch and also Joshua Himes. When we look at Josiah Litch, it says this, The daily sacrifice is the present reading of the English text, but no such thing as sacrifice is found in the original. This is acknowledged on all hands. It is a gloss or construction put on it by the translators. The true reading is the daily and the transgression of desolation. Pause. So is he dealing with the issue of the sac word sacrifice being supplied? Well, yeah, he is. Yes, uh, it's not, not a trick question. He's dealing with the fact that the word sacrifice is not in the original, correct? So, so, so again, they had the correct understanding of the word sacrifice being supplied, right? But to try to say that that was, in other words, let's continue on going. So yes, he understands the word sacrifice is supplied, but he does not separate that from the correct view of the daily itself. Okay, let's continue on. <clears throat> The true reading is the daily and the transgression of desolation. Daily and transgression being connected together by and. The daily desolation and the transgression of desolation, they are two desolating powers which were to desolate the sanctuary and host, the church and a metropolis. They are paganism and popery. So did he understand that the word sacrifice was supplied? Yes. yes. Did he somehow teach that separately and independently of the daily being paganism? No. So when people try to say the argument is that they only have the true light on the word sacrifice being supplied, that is not correct. They always understood in the context of the word sacrifice being supplied that the daily was actually a noun and it was dealing with the power. Do you all understand this point right here, friends? Okay. So don't let anyone ever tell you that they only understood they were correct on the issue of the sacrifice being supplied, but they were incorrect on the daily. No, they had the correct view of it, those who gave the judgment hour cry. All right, we continue on. Yes. <clears throat> That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Let's continue on. James White says the same thing. <clears throat> Was James White part of the judgment hour cry? Yes. <clears throat> now, he was actually somewhat more of a little-known uh, Millerite preacher. Uh, he was more of a circuit rider. He had small audiences. So, uh, you know, never count out those on the, on the sides. You know, the, uh, the, uh, the less, uh, the, the, the lights that shine not as bright, because he then later on became a bright, shining star in Adventism. Uh, the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation represent what? Rome and its pagan and papal forms. Leaving out the supplied words, the text would read the daily and the transgression of desolation. These are two desolating powers, first paganism and then the papacy. So are they dealing with the issue of the word sacrifice being supplied? 
Yes, and it's always connected with the true identity of the daily. Are you understanding this, friends? It being paganism. So the point being, when you read the quote in early writings 74 and 75, where Ellen White says that the word sacrifice is applied and God gave the correct view of it, the correct view is in connection with the daily itself. The sacrifice is applied and the daily is a power. Okay, it's not dealing with the verb. Now, how many of you understand the issue of uh, that word uh, tamim, the word daily? <clears throat> that in the Bible, in every single place in the Bible, the word tamid is either used as an adjective or an adverb. Okay? Yeah. Now, we dealt with this in Klamath Falls a little bit. You used to be a school teacher. Once again, Darlene, would you please explain to us what an adverb and an adjective is? Before, yeah. I, before I read, no, what's the word? That, um, describes uh, a noun. An adverb is a word that describes an ad, uh, a verb. All right. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. We'll also just see what Noah Webster says right here. In 1828 dictionary, an adjective in grammar is a word used with a noun to express a quality of the thing named or something attributed to it or to limit or define it or just to specify or describe a thing as distinct from something else. It is called also an attributive or attribute. Thus, in the phrase, a wise ruler, wise is the adjective or attribute expressing a particular property of the ruler, which is the noun. You got that? Did everyone understand that right there? Right? So the word wise ruler, what is the noun? Ruler is the noun. Where's the adjective? Wise. It describes the ruler. It's an attribute of the ruler, right? Same thing with an adverb. <clears throat> you look at an adverb. An adverb. In grammar is a word used to modify the sense of a verb, a participle, an adjective or attribute, and usually placed near it as he writes well, paper extremely white. <clears throat> this part of speech might be more significantly named a modifier, as its use is to modify, that is to vary or qualify the sense of another word. By largening or restraining it, or by expressing form, quality, or manner which the word itself does not express. The term adverb denoting position merely is often improper. So what this means is that the word daily or tamid in the Bible all through the scriptures, except for Daniel, but all through the scriptures, it is used to describe something else. All right? Are you all with me, friends? So in the Old Testament, they had a literal daily sacrifice, right? So the word sacrifice in the Old Testament, not the book of Daniel, but all throughout the Old Testament, the word sacrifice was actually the noun. That was the subject, the word sacrifice, and the daily was describing the sacrifice. It was an adverb or an adjective. Are you understanding this? Yeah. <clears throat> the difference is in the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel is the only book in the Bible that uses the word tamid as a noun. Did you get that? Yeah. That means that the word daily in the book of Daniel is not a descriptive word for something else. It is the subject of prophecy. You got that? Yeah. Now, the King, the, when the King James translators translated it they, it, they had an anomaly there. This is the only place in the Bible where Tom Edis uses a noun, so they didn't know what to do. So they said, well, they put the word sacrifice, because that's what they assumed. That was the common Protestant view of the time, that the papacy took away uh, or replaced Christ's ministry by the Mass and so forth. So that, because that was the popular Protestant view, they went ahead and just tried to put a descriptive word, sacrifice, but they italicized it signifying that it was added to the text. You got that? And what did Ellen White say about that issue? She said what? That it was added or supplied by man's wisdom and does not belong to the text. So what Ellen White was saying was that the word daily should be by itself. The word sacrifice should not be there. And the, they had the correct view that it was an independent issue or subject of prophecy. It was a noun. Are you, are you all with me so far? Okay. Now when we look at that issue... <clears throat> In Daniel chapter 8, I want to explain something here to you. And I want to make this as simple and basic as possible to explain the daily from Daniel chapter 8. Is that, is that all right? Is that fair? All right. How many of you are familiar with uh, repetition and enlargement? Everybody here? For example, Daniel chapter, you can look on the, look on the board up here. Daniel chapter 2 <clears throat> repeats and enlarges where? Seven. Seven. Daniel 7. And Daniel 7 repeats and enlarges where? Daniel 8. All right, Daniel 8 repeats and enlarges in Daniel 11. So let's go ahead and go through this very quickly. So in Daniel chapter 2, so let's go ahead and write down the powers. What, what, what 
major world powers are we dealing with in these chapters? Okay? I'm going to have you help me out. So we have what? Okay, so Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, Pagan Rome, and then the Papacy. All right. And of course, after that, we can also establish that we can find the United States in there and also the Ten Kings. But we'll just deal with this right now. <clears throat> All right. Daniel chapter 2. Give me, give me the symbols for these powers. Gold. Okay. Okay, so this is chapter 2, right? All right, give me the symbols for Daniel 7. Bear. Leopard. Oh, I'm wanting you all to help me out here. What else? Then what? Terrible beast. I guess we... Does anyone mind if I say dragon? Some people might have an issue because it doesn't say dragon. It says not. It's a terrible, undescribable beast. So I'll put dragon because Rome is symbolized by a dragon in Revelation 12 and so forth. So let me just go ahead and put dragon. And by the way, if you want to pick on me about that, I'll just point up here that pagan Rome is a dragon too. <laughs> okay? All right, so we have the dragon, and then we have what? It's the beast. That, what, what, and then what's the papacy here? Daniel 7, what is the papacy? Little horn. All right. All right, then we come to Daniel what? We come to Daniel 8. All right, now, pay attention. Turn to Daniel 8. <clears throat> What's the first thing that we have in there? Verse 4, I saw the what animal? The ram, pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no beast might stand before it. And then it says in verse 5, as I was considering, behold, a what? A he-goat coming from the west in the face of the whole earth. So here we have, so Medo-Persia, so Babylon is not described, and I'll explain in a minute why. I believe that is. So that's gone. So what is Medo-Persia symbolized by? No, no, no. Daniel 8. Ram with two horns. What is uh, Greece symbolized by? The, the he-goat divides into four horns later on, just like the leopards have four heads. And what about... Uh, Pagan Rome, what happens there in verse 8? Look at what it says. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and four it came up four notable ones from the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came forth the what? A little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. All right, pause. So, and then it goes on down, and it talks about it waxed great even to the host of heaven. It cast down some of the hosts and of the stars to the ground, stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, the place of the sanctuary was cast down, and a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, it cast down the truth to the ground to practice and prosper. Now pause. So what power comes up after the goat? The little horn, right? Who's the little horn? It's pagan and papal Rome. Because it doesn't separate the two right there, it deals with Rome and what they would do, right? Little horn doesn't say there was a little horn and a little horn after that, does it? So the little horn represents Rome and its pagan and papal forms, correct? How do we know which one is which? <clears throat> no. Okay, well, yes, but there's, let's, let's go there now, okay? Let, let me backtrack and just say something. Yes, you're right, and yes, you're right, but I'm looking for a different answer is what it was. So yes, you can tell what it is by what it does and the, male, and, the, and, the, and the male and female neuter of the pronoun. But I want to have us understand very clearly what is described by Daniel 8. So let's go there very quickly, Daniel chapter 8 and verse 9. And if you don't understand this, let me just show you how you can study the Bible with somebody else to show them what this power is. So Daniel chapter 8, verse 9. Daniel 8, verse 9. Are we all there, friends? Amen. And out of one of them, that was out of one of the directions of the ancient Macedonian Empire, 
That was out of, uh, they took over one of the territories. And by the way, it's right here. You can actually see this. It's right here on the 1850 chart. 168, it says Rome conquered the first division of Greece. Okay? The first division of Greece, and then it talks about the time of the league. And here we have the divisions of Greece are right here. And you see what it says, Egypt, Syria, Thrace, and Macedonia. So it says Rome conquered the first division, which was Macedonia. You see that? So the Roman Empire did not come from the Greek Empire, but it conquered one of the divisions of the empire. So when it says right there that out of one of them is dealing with out of one of those divisions of Greece, Rome conquered that area to take over. You got that? And that's in Daniel 11 where it says that he shall become strong with a small people. All right, let's continue on. So out of one of them, out of one of those divisions of Greece, by conquering that division, came forth a little horn, that's pagan Rome, which waxed exceeding great toward the what? <clears throat> huh? Toward the south and east and the pleasant land. So here they take over all the rest of the Macedonian Empire. They take over the south, which is up in Egypt. They take over Thrace and Syria, which was the east, right? So they go south. So look at this. Look at this map right here. So they conquer Macedonia, it's the first division. Then they conquer three other ones right there, the south, Egypt, the east, Syria and the Pleasant Land, okay? Are you understanding this? So pagan Rome now takes over the entire ancient Medo uh, uh, Macedonian Empire. They now rule the world. They've taken over. They're now the next empire. As Greece has fallen, they've now taken over, all right? Now as we continue on, let's notice what the Bible says in verse 10. Now what I want you to pay attention to is that the male and the female gender of the pronoun changes in each of these verses, verse 9, 10, 11, and 12. And this is important to understand, okay? The people confuse this and they mix up the identity of the papacy with the pagan Rome. Pagan Rome would be symbolized by what's gender? Male. Why? Because that was the kingly power. The papacy would be symbolized by which gender? Female, the feminine pronoun. Why? Because it's a church, okay? So in verse 9, when it deals with a little horn, a little horn is in the male, okay? So this is pagan Rome that conquers the south, the east, and the pleasant land. But when you come down to verse 10, it no longer says he, it says and what? It. The reason why it says it is the female pronoun, okay? This is the female pronoun, so it wax great. So what power is in verse 10 then? You might want to jot down a note in your Bible uh, that verse 9 is pagan Rome. Verse 10 is now papal Rome. It, the papacy, waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and of what else? The stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Now, this is obviously dealing with a twofold history right here. Number one, it's showing the power of Satan that is behind the papacy, because we know that the devil swept out a third of the stars out of heaven. But it's also dealing with the literal work the papacy did in casting down the stars. Because who are the stars in Bible prophecy? The God's messengers, God's people. Remember in Daniel chapter 12, uh, Daniel is told that they that turn many to righteousness shall shine as the stars forever and ever. And Jesus says, I'm upholding the seven stars in my right hand and write it to the angel of the church. Stars are angels or messengers or leaders. So here we have the papal work of casting down and stamping upon God's people. Are you all with me, friends? Let's come down now to verse 11. And it says he stamped upon them, by the way. So he's trampling them underfoot. So this, this desolating power of the papacy tramples God's people, right? Let's continue on in verse 11. Now notice the change. Verse 11 says, yea, what? He. he. It's back to the male. So what's powers in verse 11? Pagan. pagan Rome. This is pagan Rome in verse 11. Please don't miss that point. Yea, he pagan Rome magnified himself even to the prince of the host. Who's the prince of the host? Jesus. Jesus. Did pagan Rome exalt himself against Jesus Christ? How? By crucifying. This is why it says right here. It deals with the fact that the prince of the host, and look at what it says right here. It actually quotes Rome, pagan and papal, but here's pagan Rome, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He's destroyed wonderfully. And on and on, but it talks about standing up against the prince of princes. And it's proving that, that Antiochus Epiphanes couldn't stand up against the prince of princes and so forth. So I'm going to move on. So here we have pagan Rome, and that's why the pioneers put pagan Rome on both sides right here, along with the cross of Christ. It was pagan Rome 
that was standing up against the prince of princes, all right? Against the prince of the host. And uh, you can also uh, prove that in Daniel chapter 11. And let me just give that to you real quick. In Daniel 11, you can write this down. <clears throat> in Daniel chapter 11, verse 20, 21, and 22. So Daniel 11, verses 20 through 22, it gives the history of pagan Rome. It gives the history of Augustus Caesar, Tiberius Caesar, and then Tiberius Caesar breaking the prince of the covenant in verse 22. Jesus was crucified under Tiberius Caesar. You go back and read your Ryan Smith's book on that. All right, let's move on. So verse 11, Daniel 8, verse 11. Yea, he, pagan Rome, magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him, by who? Pagan Rome, the daily was what? Now, does anyone know what that word taken away means in the original language as well? It is the word room, which means to set up or to exalt. The word taken away in Daniel 8, 11 is a different word than Daniel 11, 31, and also Daniel chapter 12, verse 10 and 11. Are you, did you all get me right there? You didn't get me? Okay. I'll say it one more time. Sorry. I know it's been a long day. The word taken away in Daniel chapter 8 is a different word than the word taken away in Daniel 11 and 12. Okay? The word used by Daniel for taken away in Daniel 11 and 12 literally means to take away. But in Daniel chapter 8, that, and by the way, the word used for taken away in Daniel 11 and 12, and you can write that down. It's Daniel 11, 31, where it says the daily shall be taken away. We'll come back there. And also Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. You see the daily taken away. Those two words right there are the word sir, S-U-R, sir, which means to actually take away, or take out of the way, or move away. Okay? But the word take away in Daniel 8, 11 is the word room, which means to exalt or to set up. You get that? Yeah. You, you might be asking, well, how come they use the word take away? I don't know why they did that. Just, you, know, some of, you know, some of the... Old English is translated that way. But that's the actual word. It's, it's ru'um, okay? R-U-U-M, ru'um. So let's read that one more time. Verse 11. Yea, he. Who's the he? Pagan Rome. Pagan Rome. He magnified himself even to who? How did he do that? By crucifying Christ. And by him. By who? Pagan Rome. The daily was roomed or exalted or set up and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now, let me explain what those two words are. That word sanctuary is the word mikdash. Do I need to write some of this stuff down, or are you all writing notes for me? Do I need to write down notes? Okay. Taken away is room. That's the word used for taken away. Okay? But what it means is to set up or lift up, or to exalt. All right? The word for sanctuary is mikdash, not kodesh. There's two words used in the Bible for sanctuary. The one is kodesh. Kodesh always, always refers to God's sanctuary, where mikdash does not. Mikdash can symbolize either a pagan temple or God's temple, or it can symbolize a palace or a fortress in the Bible. You got that? So let me write that down. So here we have mikdash. So mikdash can either be translated, more properly translated, a temple, or sometimes it can be translated as a palace in certain parts of the Bible. And the final word right there is the word cast down. And let me go ahead and give you the word for that as well. That's Strong's number 7999. And the word for cast down is the word shalem. Okay? And the word shalem means to be whole, to be made complete. So shalem. You can look all these up in the Strong's Dictionary or any other kind of concordance or commentary or any, uh, so forth. So shalem means to complete or to be made whole. All right, are you all still with me? All right, so let's read that one more time. You ready? Let's find out what the daily is in Daniel 8, 11. Yea, he. Okay, well, as I read that, I want you to tell me the answer, okay? Yea, he. Who's that? Pagan Rome. He magnified himself even to the prince of the host. Who's that? How did he magnify himself against Christ? 
crucifying Christ. And by him, by who? Pagan Rome, the daily, and what's the daily? Paganism was ruumed, or what? Was lifted up and exalted. Did pagan Rome exalt paganism? Yes, they did. And the place of his, that is Rome's temple, the place of Rome's temple or palace was made complete. Are you get you got that? What was Rome's temple? The Pantheon. I don't know if you just caught that, friends. The modern day teaching of the daily where people are trying to make that Christ sanctuary ministry, they're trying to make the Pantheon Christ sanctuary ministry. Are you understanding this, friends? They're trying to mix the identity of Christ and Satan. And I've actually heard people say, well, you know, both, both interpretations are perfectly acceptable in Adventism. You know, you believe this way, I believe this way. With all due respect, friends, it's even beyond that. Let's not even get into the doctrinal issues of the daily. Let's not even get into how it ties into time prophecy. Let's not even talk about how it ties into the 2300 days. Let's just talk about the two interpretations of the daily itself. One is Christ and one is Satan. How on earth can you synthesize those two interpretations and say they're perfectly acceptable in Adventism? Are you understanding this, friends? One, you have the devil and his sanctuary. The other one, you have Jesus and his sanctuary. One or the other, common sense and reason demand that it has to be one or the other. You understanding this, friends? So once again, pagan Rome ruined or set up and exalted paganism and his temple, that is the what? The pantheon was made complete. You got that, friends? And that's exactly what happened in that history. After crucifying Christ, you know, the Pantheon was set up, I think it was in B.C. sometime. It wasn't, it wasn't completed until uh, the second century uh, uh, A.D. And so in that same context, the Pantheon was then made complete and set up by pagan Rome. Now look at verse 12. Verse 12 says, And a host or an army was given him. Now you see that word him is italicized? Why do you think that word him is italicized? Why did they add him in verse 12? That's right. You got it. I'm trying to make you all think. Verse 12, the female pronoun is actually feminine. So they add the male because they're trying to make sense out of it, but it's actually female. The verse 12, the subject is not a him, it is a her, which means it is now transitioned from, back, from pagan Rome back to papal Rome. So verse 12 is now papal Rome. And host or an army was given papal Rome against the daily by reason of transgression and it cast down the truth to the ground and it practiced and prospered. So the papacy cast down the truth and practiced and prospers and the papacy receives an army or a host to fight against the pagans. Are you with me, friends? Are you all with me still? Okay. So once again, just a quick review. Verse 9, the little horn in verse 9 is pagan Rome. Verse 10 is it, papal Rome. Verse 11 is he, pagan Rome. And verse 12 is once again what? Papal Rome. All right, now let me explain this. So let's go back to our little, uh, our little study here. Okay, are you all still with me, friends? <clears throat> all right, Daniel 8. Edo Persia symbolized by what? Ram. Ram. Greece is symbolized by what? Pagan Rome is symbolized by what? Papal Rome is symbolized by what? But what other two things are the symbols of pagan and papal Rome? Daily and the transgression of desolation. Are you with me, friends? It's explained in the next verse. Let's go there, Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8, verse 13. Then I heard, now let me ask you a question. What was the subject? What was going on from verses 9, 10, 11, and 12? What was going on? What was going back and forth? It was, the verses were transitioning from which two powers? Pagan to papal. Pagan to papal. Right? And so the angel, after the vision of pagan papal, pagan papal, the question is this. Look at the question. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said, under that certain saint which spake, how long shall be the vision concerning what? The daily and the? Pagan and papal Rome. Are you with me, friends? 
So how long shall be this vision concerning these two powers? The daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. It will be 2,300 days until the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, I want to explain something before I get more deeply involved in pagan Rome being the daily. Now, we understand that the daily symbolizes paganism in general, okay? But even more particularly, it symbolizes pagan Rome when you look at it more closely. So in the book of Daniel, it is not wrong to say that it can symbolize paganism, but more particularly pagan Rome. Do you all get that, friends? Okay. Let me actually prove that to you. Why do you think Daniel chapter 8 starts with Medo-Persia rather than Babylon? Okay, let me, let me backtrack. Let me ask you... Let me, let me backtrack and ask you another question. You got it, but don't let anyone hear you say that until I ask my question. Okay. When we look at pagan Rome, when they established, what did they do the daily? It says they established the daily. They lifted up and exalted the daily, didn't they? And they created a temple for the daily. What was the temple called? The Pantheon. What were the teachings of the Pantheon? It was called the temple of what? Of all the gods. Where were the gods from? All the pagan nations from Assyria and Babylon and all these various things. Are you with me, friends? So all that Rome did to become the daily, the Rome, pagan Rome became the epitome of the daily because they had assumed all these other pagan powers. Are you with me, friends? So when the angel asks, how long shall this vision be for the daily in Daniel chapter 8... What is the answer? Under 2,300 days. Why did the angel say 2,300 days? Because where did the vision of the daily begin in Daniel 8? With Medo-Persia. Did you just get what I said? There's a point to what... Let me ask you a question. I think some of that just went right over your heads. Only half the answer. And we're not getting into the 2520 and all that stuff in the nation. Yes. Amen. Now, the point what I'm trying to do is make it, this is, this is Daniel chapter 8, uh, class 101. All right? So we can go to 201 and 301 and so forth when we get into the Calzone and the Mare Visions. So we come down into the indignation, the last end of the indignation, how that would be explained in Daniel 11. We're not going to get into that right now. What we're going to simply talk about is why did Daniel chapter 8 start with Medo-Persia, not Babylon? Anyone ever wondered that before? Nobody's ever wondered, anybody ever wondered why? I have, anyone wonder, well, hey, Daniel chapter 2 starts with Babylon, and Daniel chapter 7 starts with Babylon. Why does Daniel chapter 8 start with Medo-Persia? No, 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 see, see, no, 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 that, see, that was my answer all for years. See, my answer was, well, you know, Belshazzar was about to be killed, his kingdom was going down. Belshazzar was still in power in Daniel chapter 8. Go there, go to Daniel chapter 8, let me shoot this. Daniel chapter 8, verse 1. Daniel chapter 8, see these... I've questioned this, and I've even preached on it, and you know, I've passed, I've passed this on to other people, and they've been satisfied. But when I go back, I said, no, there has to be a different answer to this. Because look at Daniel 8, Daniel chapter 8, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King who? Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. And so notice, what kingdom is in power when Daniel 8 begins? Babylon. So it would logically, you would logically think that God would do the same thing he did before and start with the kingdom of Babylon. And Babylon's still in power. Well, hang on. Are you, all, are you all with me, though? You're all with me, correct? So why doesn't God start Daniel 8 with Babylon? Because he was giving a key to the 2300-day prophecy. Are you all with me, friends? When Daniel had a vision and it started with Medo-Persia, and then the question was, how long would this issue of the daily be that I just saw, beginning with which kingdom? Medo-Persia say, well, this, power, this issue of the daily going down to the trampling of the sanctuary in this vision would be for 2,300 days because it starts with Medo-Persia. You got that? And so what Daniel was led to do was to say, wait a minute, well, this vision of the 2,300-day prophecy is linked to the daily of this vision, which is starting with Medo-Persia, and I'm going to start looking for my date to start this date in Medo-Persia. You got it, friends? Did you just get that point? You see that? If it started with Babylon and said under 2,000 days, we would have started looking in Babylon for the starting date. You see that? 
So God, and, and you're saying, well, you're nuts. You're making it up. You know what? Since I've understood that point, guess what the Lord did? He confirmed it. That understanding, guess how he confirmed that understanding? On this chart right here. I never saw this before. Look at what it says. Explanation of the time. A prophetic year or time is 360 days. And only seven, year, uh, seven times is seven times 360, 25, 20 years. Time times and half a time is 1260. We're not going to get into the 25, 20 right now. Here's the point. Here it is. Ready? The length of the daily of Daniel 8.13 is from B.C. 457 to 508. You got that? So the pioneers understood that the length of the daily in Daniel 8 was dealing with Medo-Persia down to 508, and then 508, when it's taken away, comes down to, of course, you add them all up, and you have 2,300 years. So the 2,300-year prophecy was connected with the length of the daily and 457 as well. Are you getting this, friends? So in other words, you cannot divorce the daily of Daniel chapter 8 from the 2,300-day prophecy. Am, am I going way over your, all your heads, or are you, are you getting this point? Let me, let, me, let me make it even more simple. Let me, let me make it more simple here. Because people, people still try to say, well, we don't need the correct view of the daily to understand the 2300 days, but that's all the pioneers needed that. It was the key that unlocked the 2300 day prophecy. We have two choices. Thank you. 15 minutes. We have two choices for the 2300 day prophecy. All right? And it's connected with the daily. You got it? On one side, we have the view that is paganism. Remember, this is dealing with Daniel 8, correct? One side is paganism. The other side says that it's Christ's ministry in the sanctuary. Only one of them can be correct. Okay? Why? Because it's not only they are opposites, but it's connected to the 2300 day prophecy. You get it? May I ask you a question? What does Ellen White say is the central pillar and foundation of Adventism? The 2300 day prophecy in the sanctuary. Okay? But guess what? She calls it the central pillar, not the only pillar. There are other pillars that connect to the central pillar. You got it? And one of the pillars is this right here. So let's go ahead and look at this. On one side, if we date the daily of Daniel 8, dealing with pagan, because remember, what did pagan Rome do? Pagan Rome simply exalted and put it in place and put a sanctuary for the paganism, which was the pantheon. Are you with me, friends? So they incorporated all these pagan teachings. So if we date paganism of Daniel 8, starting with Medo-Persia, right? What date do we find for the decree of Medo-Persia? 457 BC, which would then end when? I'm talking about the 2300 days. I'm not talking about just the length of the, because remember, because remember, the question was how long would the daily and the transgression of desolation be? And we know that 2520 connects with that, but we're just dealing with the 2300 days, okay? We're just going to make it simple right now, all right? So this right here connects 457, and what do we have? As a result of looking at the daily as paganism, starting with Medo-Persia, we now have what date? 1844. And what does 1844 confirm? It confirms, oh yeah, yeah that's, well, I'm not going to deal with it. Again, I'm purposely bypassing the 2520. Okay? I'm purposely bypassing it. Because the only way to see the 2520 is to see the daily. All right? So I'm bypassing it just to deal with the daily and the 2300 days, okay? So in, in 1844, what comes to light? The sanctuary, what else? The Sabbath, what else? The spirit of prophecy in 1844? Are we, all, are we all together, friends? So based upon a correct understanding of the daily, it points us down to 1844, the sanctuary, the Sabbath, and the spirit of prophecy. Got that? If we look at Christ's sanctuary ministry being the daily, What is the, the first date that, now people by, people, by the way, people say, well, it was the papacy that set, uh, set aside the sanctuary ministry, right? So that means the 2300 day prophecy couldn't start until 538 when the papacy was set up, right? But even if we erase that, people say, well, the papacy's always been around and the spirit was there in the first century. Let's give people the benefit of the doubt, right? 
Let's, let's go to the very first date that Christ could ever have a sanctuary ministry. 31 A.D. So let's go. So 31 A.D., add 2,300 days, and what do you have? 2,331 A.D. You got that? What happened in 1844? What happens to the sanctuary? What happens to the Sabbath? What happens to the spirit of prophecy? And this is why when you read J.S. Washburn's arguments, when you read his arguments, guess what he says? He says, since the daily was introduced into the church by Daniels and Prescott and into the colleges, it says that back in his day, they began to publish books removing our prophetic dates with a sliding scale. Which means that all of our, all of our dates are open to interpretation. That was why he was so adamant about the daily and attacking that false view. It was bringing in new theology. Are you with me, friends? It destroyed 1844. It destroyed the spirit of prophecy. And that's why they were so adamant about that quote. And it destroys the sanctuary as well. Are you with me, friends? It comes down like a house of cards. Now, people don't see this. They say, oh, this is the minor issue and blah, 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 blah. It's not a minor issue. And now we're going to explain why. How much time do I have? Am I already out of time? This is... Right, I'm gonna keep on going. So I have a little more time on the DVD, I guess. All right. I have to finish this up at least, because in our next lecture, I got to go into Balaam and Balak. I got to go into that one. All right. Because remember, it's the women that burned the vine. Remember that? Yeah. So I got to go into that one. So let's go ahead and look at the. Da Is this making some sense right here, friends, of how it's connected? All right. But even beyond this, why is it present truth today? So this is the stuff, everything that I've mentioned is what our pioneers understood that raised the danger signal. Haskell, Washburn, and others. These are, they understood the problem with this new theology, all right? It, it, it destroys our identity, it, ruins, it sweeps our Adventism away. But why is it present truth for us today? So yes, we can make an argument, well, we need to stand on the foundations, this confirms the foundations, but there's even something deeper. Yes? Futurism. That's right. Amen. And you know what's interesting about this right here is all these future time, all these future prophecies. That's 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 Jesuitism. That's that's futurism. That's Car Cardinal Francisco Rivera right there. And uh, and we can go on. And we're going to stop right there now. Why is it a present truth topic today, though? Right. All right. All right, so let's... All right, amen. So let's go into that because you mentioned something that's correct. The reason why the daily is present true today is because the daily symbolizes the United States of America, right? Because remember, the apex, the apex of the daily, the apex, the crescendo of the daily is found in which power? It was found where? It was pagan Rome. Pagan Rome was the apex of the daily power. They set up the sanctuary, the pantheon. Are you with me, friends? So what I'm dealing with is anciently. Anciently, the daily power was dealing with pagan Rome. Are you all with me so far? Yes. Okay. Pagan Rome. Pagan Rome was the apex anciently of the ancient pagan kingdoms. All right? You got that, friends? It was the apex, it was the strongest, it was symbolized by iron, it ruled the longest, it was the one that absorbed all the mystery religions into paganism. Now we know that the papacy adopted these things, but it was no longer a professed pagan religion, it was now a professed Christian religion, right? But we're dealing with paganism, in just paganism. The apex through crescendo 
of paganism in a civil power is found in where? Pagan Rome. Are you with me, friends? Now let me give you the clues or the keys to why it's present truth today. Are you ready for this? So let's go ahead and look at this now. I want to give you a quotation. This is coming from 13th volume of the manuscript releases, page 394. I want to show this to you now. Uh, 13 MR, page 394, paragraph 1 and 2. We have no time to lose. Troublous times are before us. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. Soon the scene of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. The prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Much Now listen to what this says right here. Now I want to pause. What part of Daniel 11 still needs to be fulfilled? And what she was talking about in her day. 40 to 45. Okay? But now she quotes something else of history that's already been completed, but now is going to be repeated. So Daniel, when she's writing this, Daniel 11, 40 through 45 still have to be fulfilled. Right? But what she says is there are also other parts of Daniel 11 that have already been fulfilled, but that will be repeated again. 31 through 36. Let's look at this. Much of the history that has taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy, what prophecy? Daniel 11 will be repeated. In the 30th verse, a power of spoken of that shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant, so shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. And then it says, verses what? 31 through 36 are quoted. So Ellen White says, Daniel 11, 30 through 36 are going to be repeated again. They're going to be repeated as Daniel 11, 40 through 45 are fulfilled. Are you all getting what I'm saying here? Scenes similar to those described in these words. What words? The ones you just quoted, 30 through 36. We see evidence that Satan is fast obtaining the control of human minds who have not the fear of God before them. Let all read and understand the prophecies of this book. We are now entering upon the time of trouble spoken of. And then she calls Daniel 12, 1 through 4. All right? So let me ask you a question. Um, if a prophet says that certain portions of the Bible are going to be repeated and that we should study them, what do you think we should do? We should probably go back and study them, right? So, so why don't we go ahead and do that right now, okay? Is that all right? So let's go back to Daniel 11. Let's find out why she says these verses will be repeated. Daniel 11, 30 through 36. All right, this is going to be the rest of our study for uh, this lecture. And I want to show you how this relates to the United States of America. And then we will take a break and we'll come back for our last talk tonight, which is dealing with the mole by women and Baal Peor. Daniel chapter 11, verses 30 through 36. So once again, these are the verses that Ellen White says that much of this history is going to be repeated. So let's talk about it. Daniel 11, beginning with verse 30. And if you're there, you can please just let me know by saying amen. amen. For the ships of Kittim shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet shall, they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. Now when they shall fall, they shall be helped with a little help, and many shall cleave to them with flatteries. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. And then verse 36, and the king shall do according to his will. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done. All right, so these are the verses Ellen White says are going to be repeated. So what is the subject matter of these verses? That's right. This is the, this is the history of the removal of the daily, the setting up of the papacy in a time of persecution. Right? Isn't that what it's talking about? Now, 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 the basic understanding of this, this is when, verse 30, let's go ahead and look at this verse very quickly, verse 29. Verse 29 says, At the time appointed he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. Does anyone know what that time is right there? 
in Daniel 11. Uriah Smith talks about it as well in his book. This is the time of Daniel 11.24, where Rome cast his forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. Okay? No, no, no. That verse 24, Daniel 11, verse 24, talks about Rome forecasting his devices against the strongholds even for a time. Now, what was the stronghold for Rome? What, what stronghold did pagan Rome want to control? This was the city of Rome. Now, you guys should know this, right? Because you're, this is the city of Rome, right? The stronghold. All right? So let's write this down. So the stronghold or the city of Rome would be controlled for how long? That's right, for a time, which is one year, or 360 days, or 360 years. Now, in that verse, it deals with the battle that takes place. Go back and read Uriah Smith's book. He gives a lot of, ev he gives a lot of evidence for this. This is correct. He, he, he's correct on this, on this verse, by the way. And he talks about the Battle of Actium. The Battle of Actium, which took place September 2nd, 31 B.C. All right? The Battle of Actium was a decisive battle for Rome to control the city of Rome anciently. Okay? What's that? This is Daniel 11, 24. Okay? So the Battle of Actium, which takes place in 31 BC, so if you date 360 years from 31 BC, where do you come to? 330 what? AD. So when you come down to verse 29, verse 29, and I'm just going to keep on moving on. I, you know, I'm just going to give you the information. You can go back, get the DVD, pause it, stop it, study it. Verse 29 says, At the time appointed, he, pagan Rome still, shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. So what is the time appointed right there in verse 29? It's the expiration of the time prophecy. So in 330 AD, pagan Rome comes back, but he doesn't come back to the stronghold. He forsakes the stronghold, and he comes back down toward the south. He's not as the former or as the latter. Why? What happened in 330 AD? Constantine moves his capital from the west to... The east. So the stronghold of the city of Rome was only for a time and would be forsaken in 330 AD. You got that? Okay. Are you all still with me, friends? Okay. What happens in verse 30? For the ships of Kittim shall come against him. Who is the ships of Kittim? Genseric, the Vandal, and all the other pagan, the, 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 the Goths, and so forth. This is, uh, the ships of Kittim are not only... Um, uh, symbolizing the Vandal Wars uh, under the second trumpet, but it's also dealing with the first four trumpets. These are the pagan invasions that collapse Rome. Okay? That happened right after 330 AD. The first invasion was by uh, Alaric the Goth in 395. So right after he forsook the stronghold, they start having the Kitsum come down and destroy pagan Rome. Okay? Until the Hun and the third trumpet, and then Odo asks for the Herald and the fourth trumpet. Then you come down to verse 30, it says, The ships of Kitsum, the pagan invasion, shall come against him. Therefore he, that's, pa that's pagan Rome, pagan Rome shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. And by the way, during this time, was pagan Rome having indignation against Christians or the Holy Covenant? Yes, this is, this is Diocletian, this is all these, the, 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 the Roman Colosseums and so forth. Then you have it say, he shall even return, pagan Rome shall return and have intelligence or an agreement with them that do what? Who were the ones that forsook the Holy Covenant during this time period? No, 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 I'm talking about those that, well, if you forsake the Holy Covenant, that means you at one time had the Holy Covenant. Well, the Jews are already gone. Jews are no longer the God's chosen people. Christians, right? Was a Jewish, was a Jewish church God's church in 395 and 400 AD? Who was God's people? The Christian church. So who were those that were in Rome that forsook the Holy Covenant. These are the Papists. These are the Catholics. These are the ones that have been exalted from Constantine down. All right. These are the ones that began getting more riches and more pomp and more pride and more display. And so pagan Rome, where is pagan Rome's capital during this whole crisis? Well, they're attacking, they're in Constantinople. Are you with me, friends? So here we now have the pagan emperors of Rome they now are going to make an agreement or have intelligence with who? The papists who are still in the Western Empire. Are you with me, friends? And so there's an agreement made saying, look, if you guys can get rid of these pagans, you can have the West. And this is what took place beginning in 496 A.D. 
Who was the one who converted? Clovis of the Franks converts. Now, here's where I want to get a little bit deeper into this whole issue. All right? Let's see if I, what can I erase here? I'll let you choose. What do you want me to erase? Can I erase this whole thing up here? Is everyone following so far the study? Okay. Papists? Because uh, when you look at the issue of the Antichrist, uh, when you look at 1 John chapters 2 and 3, it says that the spirit of Antichrist was even now in the early Christian church. It said they were of, it said they were with us, but they went out from us because they were not at all with us. So the spirit of the papacy was the great falling away that took place. Paul prophesied about it, the elders of Ephesus and so forth. So the spirit of human tradition was alive even back in the early Christian church. Even during the days of Paul and John and so forth, there were still men that were starting to rise up and want pride and display. You see? So what they at one time professed to have the Holy Covenant, they were part of the Christian church, and they left to draw away disciples after themselves. These are the wolves that Paul prophesied about. Are you with me, friends? Okay. So when we look at this, we have so far, we're in Daniel chapter 11, verse 30, and 30, uh, 30 so far, and this is the, pap the uh, pagan Rome that has forsaken the stronghold, 330 AD. Now the ships of Kittim have come. The ships of Kittim are those Germanic tribes of the first four trumpets. The first four trumpets are symbolized by the ships of Kittim. It's also spelled with a K in the Old Testament. The ships of Kittim, these are the pagan Germanic uh, tribes. Now what's interesting about this is what does the Bible teach happened to pagan Rome in Daniel 7? It's right up here on the chart. What happened to pagan Rome in Daniel 7? The fourth beast rises up. And out of the fourth beast's head are what? Ten horns. Okay? And the little horn pops up and starts to make war with the other horns, right? Now follow this, okay? Follow this. Here's where the daily begins to start getting to be present truth. Okay? Watch this. With the daily... Let me just go and erase this. We have pagan Rome, correct? Pagan Rome is then divided into how many divisions? Symbolized by ten what? Horns. What does a horn symbolize? Daniel 7, it says these are ten what? Kings. You can read that right here. It says 490, the division of Rome completed into ten kingdoms, okay? Now let me ask you a question. These ten kings, were they, still, they were still part of the Roman Empire. They were, they were simply dividing the Roman Empire, correct? That's why they came out of the head. They were attached to the beast. It wasn't, okay? So you have pagan Rome gives rise to ten horns, or ten kings. 496, Clovis is converted, and thus the wars begin to convert the rest of these kings to Catholicism. This is the history of the taking away of the daily. The history of the taking away of the daily is the history of taking away of pagan Rome's influence. Are you with me, friends? And to convert them to Catholicism. It was in 508 that the last kingdom converted to Catholicism, which was the Britons. So you have pagan Rome, the ten horns, and once the ten horns are converted to Catholicism, they give their strength, their power, and their seat to which power? The papacy, and the papacy then sits on the throne of the earth until it receives a deadly wound. And during this time, there's persecution. That's Daniel chapter, remember that's Daniel chapter 11, verses 31 through 36. Falling by the flame, by the sword, by captivity for many days. Are you with me, friends? So who's the daily power in this right here? Pagan Rome, remember that? So pagan Rome, the daily power which then goes into these powers, they all have to be converted in order to place the papacy on the throne of the earth. Are you with me? Why do you think Ellen White would say that these verses will be repeated in our day? Which power, which power does pagan Rome symbolize today that comes before another ten kings? So this symbolizes the United States of America 
that would form an image of the beast. And what is the next power on the scene in Revelation 17? The ten horns of Revelation 17. You got that, friends? And once these ten horns of Revelation 17 are converted to Catholicism through the Sunday laws, what power do they then place back on the throne of the earth? They put the papacy right back on the throne of the earth. And what takes place? Persecution. Are you with me, friends? And the persecution, and finally the papacy will once again receive a deadly wound. That's Daniel 11.45. Right when Michael stands up. Are you with me, friends? This is the history of Daniel 11. This is the history of Daniel 11, 30 through 36. This is the history of Daniel 11, 40 through 45. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? This history must be repeated. This is why the understanding of the daily becomes present truth when you understand that the nation of America must be taken out of the way or taken away in order to set the papacy up on the throne of the earth. Are you, under, are you, are you getting it, brothers and sisters? Now, why does that become a test? The reason why that becomes a test is not the... You, you can't say, well, if you don't understand the daily's paganism, you're, 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 you're lost. That's not the test. It's understanding it in a generic way. It is understanding the symbolism, how it's pointing to the passing of what? How was the United States taken out of the way? It's through the passing of a national Sunday law, and that's when Ellen White says the angel of mercy folds her wings never to return. That is the fall of America. Are you with me, friends? That is the test, brothers and sisters. Are you with me, friends? So the true understanding of the daily becomes a life and death present truth test today when you understand that it symbolizes the United States of America passing a Sunday law, which will bring the final crisis to God's people and a close of probation upon God's people at that crisis. Are you with me, friends? That's how it symbolizes the present truth test. So the pagan Rome gives way to the ten kings, which gives way to the papacy, to persecution, and the deadly wound, which symbolizes the United States of America also giving way to the ten kings, which give rise to the papacy, persecution, and the deadly wound when Christ shall come. Did you get that, brothers and sisters? Yes. I believe the National Sunday Law is what leads to the Ten Horns taking control because Ellen White says that though she lead out, the United States will lead out in the Sunday Law, and then she says every nation on the globe would be led to follow her example. Will the image of the beast be followed by the beast himself? I'm not sure I understand your question. Mm -hmm. Yes. The image, the the image of the beast, the image of the beast is the setting up of church and state, which the entire world will follow, which puts the papacy back on the throne of the earth. Now, and, and b b really quickly, I want to answer that before I, I want to I want to get this on on re recorded real quick. I want to answer your question. But I want to record it, so I'm going to explain. Because the question was about the image of the beast. How does this scenario play into our understanding of the image of the beast, the mark of the beast, and so forth? Let me explain that really quickly. You don't mind, do you? Let's go ahead and explain that real quick. I think it'll help to clear up some confusion as well. This is something that I understand. Um, and I've also shared it with some of my brethren. Let me just explain something real quick. Did everyone get that point right there, though? How the taking away of the influence of the daily symbolized the taking away of the influence of the United States. And by the way, that's really the influence that's taking place today. This is the, and I'll get into this in our next lecture. This is the history of Balaam and Balak. Um, Balak was a civil pagan king, right? Balaam was a false prophet. Who does the false prophet symbolize today? The United States. Balaam and Balak symbolize the civil power of the fall, as civil power and also the spiritual power, the church and state issue in the United States, the false prophet. Okay? Jezebel symbolizes the papacy. But Balaam and Balak symbolize the civil and religious power that will be joined in the false prophet in the United States of America. Do you get that right there? We'll talk about that in our next lecture. But let me finish up by explaining about the image of the beast for my sister there. Um, you don't want to miss our next lecture, by the way. It's really good. The, you know, the Lord, uh, the Lord oftentimes works on patterns of threes, right? 
three steps, three angels, three tests, and so forth. When I look at the, uh, when I look at the overall message of what we're preaching, we ha- I believe that we have to emphasize to people that everything that we're teaching, that prophecy is of a progressive nature. Okay? Do you get what I just said there? Yeah. Everything builds. So, for example, when we talk about the latter rain, the reason why there's a lot of misunderstanding about the latter rain is because people have been trained in Adventism to believe that the latter rain is on one day, it's one event, and that's it. And, and exactly, you know, that's it. Just, it's over, you know? The latter rain, we're told, swells into a loud cry, right? Which means if it swells, it has to start somewhere and keep on building and building and building and building, right? So it's progressive. The loud cry builds and grows. It's progressive. The latter rain builds and grows. It's progressive. The sealing of God's people is also a progressive work. What does Ellen White say? It is a settling into truth, intellectually and spiritually, so that we cannot be moved. Are you with me, friends? So the sealing work, the latter rain, the loud cry, it is all a, something that grows and swells and builds, okay? Now, based upon that, I also believe that the Sunday law crisis is a progressive crisis as well that it's going to build and grow in intensity. Many of us have learned through sermons that we're going to turn the news on one day, Sunday law, probation is closed, that's it. I don't believe that's how it works. Just going to share with you my understanding, okay? And I can talk to you afterward and so forth. I believe that there are three tests for, or three stages of the Sunday law crisis, okay? Are you ready for it? The first stage, so I'm going to put Sunday Law Crisis. So these three stages of the Sunday Law Crisis would fall in under the, that heading. So the first stage is what we know to be called the image of the beast. Okay? Image of the beast. Now, when you look at all the spirit of prophecy quotes in their context, all together, comparing quote with quote, it's very clear that the image of the beast is not only the forming of church and state, but is actually the joining of church and state in the United States. I mean, you are, do, I don't, do I need to go through an intensive spirit of prophecy search right now? I think most of you already understand this, right? She said this is when the religious power uses the civil power to for, you know, further her dogmas and decrees. This is not just, you know, receiving federal funding for contraception, federal funding, you know. It's not dealing with federal funds. This is dealing with the church controlling the state in the United States, the joint of church and state, okay? You got that? So the image of the beast is a joining of church and state in America. Now, let me explain my beliefs. I believe that the image has been forming since the 1980s, okay? I believe that we have been in the formation of the image, that we should be awake since at least 1984, Okay? Why? What happened in 1984? No, no, this is, the ambassador to the, this is the ambassador to the Vatican, Ronald Reagan. Sends an ambassador to the Vatican, officially recognizes this system as having political influence in the world. Then in 1989, what happens then? The time of the end, Daniel 11, verse 40. This is where the papacy and Ronald Reagan unite together. This is Ronald Reagan as King Clovis, reincarnated, right? If you can use that, well, that's probably a bad word to use since we believe in the state of the dead. You know what I'm talking about. This is the, this is the, the, the uh, modern day embodiment of King Clovis, I should say. This is the man that is used as the right hand tool of the papacy to destroy other nations and convert them to Catholicism. Okay? So if you can put Ronald Reagan in 496 and the papacy being set up in 538, there's not a whole lot of time left, right? So King Clovis, 1989, that starts, this is the formation of the beginning of the joining of church and state. However, what is the apex? What is the final stamp to, to say that church and state is now officially joined in America? It's a national Sunday law, okay? So here we have a Sunday law. Well, let me just put Sunday law because some people, you know, haggle about little terms. And they say, well, national Sunday law is something else. So Sunday law. So Sunday law has to be passed. However, when you look at all the writings, go back and read, for example, the Selected Messages, read about her counsel in the Sunday law crisis, the lessons of 1889. She says several things that you'll all be familiar with, I'm sure. She talks about when, if Sunday laws are agitated or passed, number one, she says they'll be greatly agitated. Heard about this? She says the subject is going to be greatly agitated in America. So it's not going to be something that's by executive order. It's going to be something hotly debated. Now, how many of you have been hearing on the news all of this debate and controversy over contraceptives and the Catholic Church and freedom of religion? 
Now do you think if birth control is this hotly debated in the, wor in the world, what about a passing of a national Sunday law? You think that might be hotly debated for a little while? So I believe, so when we look at this thing going to be hot, greatly agitated, and then finally passed, number one, she talks about to take the whip out of the hand of the persecutors and go do missionary work on Sunday. Anybody ever read this before? Yeah. Go do medical missionary work. This is the time where Ellen White says there's coming a time where I, I want to tell you plainly, she says, and clearly that a time is soon coming that the only work done in ministerial lines will be the medical missionary work. Yeah. All the pay, that's all going away. You're going to know who's true at that time. Pa where'd Pastor so-and-so go? Oh, well, you know, he went and got a job on... Because he can't, he's, he, got, he got laid off, conference doesn't have any more money. Financial crisis. So this first issue of the image of the beast, where the Sunday law is passed, let me make it plain. This is where Sunday, this is where Sunday is passed, but the Sabbath is still allowed to be kept. Sabbath not yet outlawed. Are you all understanding this, friends? This is why Ellen White said, when, if Sunday laws are passed, what did she say to do to our churches? That's a hard one for a lot of people. She says, open them on Sunday and have uh, Christ-filled meetings and so forth. Why? What's going to happen to people walking down the road? Oh, I'm forced to go to church on Sunday. Oh, let me just go to this church right here. Oh, welcome, brother. Welcome, please. Come in. Yes, come in. Oh, i got to be here. You know, uh, let's turn to Revelation 13. And today we're going to have a Christ-filled sermon on what the Bible says about Sunday. And are you with me, friends? And so this is an opportunity for evangelism during this time. This right here, friends, the image of the beast test, follow me, the image of the beast test is the test for Seventh-day Adventists. Are you with me, friends? This is the test for Seventh-day Adventists. When these things begin to happen, Seventh-day Adventists know, I can't believe it's here already. You mean it's here already? I, I, I'm not prepared to lose my job. I, I, they're not even being persecuted yet. Are you with me, friends? I believe that this is going to be a short time. Because once this is passed, what does Ellen White say in Great Controversy 589 and 590? She says that Satan will work as a destroyer. Populous cities will be reduced to ruin and desolation, nat natural disasters and calamities, a loss of temporal prosperity as a collapse of the economy. Why? She says that way the cry will take place. You guys are the troubles of Israel, right? And she says that they're going to demand that Sunday laws will be strictly enforced to bring back temporal prosperity. Are you with me, friends? So this is the test for Seventh-day Adventists to show you, you got oil? No, better go buy some. And as they go to buy it, guess what happens, friends? Sunday laws are strictly enforced quickly. And the second test now comes, which is not the image of the beast, it's now the what? The mark of the beast. And all that means is not only church and state join and Sunday laws pass, but now Sunday laws, Sunday is strictly enforced. And Sabbath is now what? Sabbath is now outlawed. And hence, if you break Sabbath, you receive persecution. <coughs> this is the time right here, brothers and sisters, where we're going to have many martyrs. Fine, it's going to start with you know, fines, prison, exile, and finally martyrs. The mark of the beast test, friends, probation is already closed upon Adventism. Are you with me, friends? When Sabbath is outlawed, and Sunday is strictly enforced as they've tried to go back. Those who understand, I can't believe it's here already. I, I, I'm not prepared. Go back and buy. Buy that oil. And they go to buy the oil and door shuts. Are you with me, friends? And they're not prepared to stand for the crisis and many go out from among us, we're told. This now is the mark of the beast test. It's not a test for Seventh-day Adventists. It now becomes the test for the world. Are you all with me, friends? Those that give the message to the world are those who successfully pass that first test. And the only way they pass that first test is because, guess what? 
They recognized the Elijah message on 9-11 and started preparing character a long time before that. They've been getting oil in their vessels before that crisis. The wise and foolish are revealed at this crisis right here, friends. And the foolish doesn't say the door, the parable does not say the door shuts at the midnight cry. Does it? It says when the cry goes forward, they wake up and realize. And as they try to go back and prepare, the door is shut at that time. Are you with me, friends? So as the loud cry is swelling, so you have the loud cry. Now, of course, 9-11, the Elijah message. The latter rain is what? It's sprinkling. Correct? But guess what happens at this time? What happens at this time when the image of the beast and Sunday laws are passed? It starts to, it's the outpouring. This is the outpouring of the Elisha message. And there are some Seventh-day Adventists that are going forward and other ones that are saying, I'm not ready, I'm not ready, I'm not ready. Are you with me, friends? And as the wise say, go back and, I can't give you my experience, you need to go back and buy. And as they try to go back and buy, the message is swelling and swelling into a loud cry. And when his Sabbath is now outlawed and Sunday is strictly enforced, there's only faithful seven days left in the world. And those are the ones that go forward to give the loud cry to the world, come out of her, my people, lest you receive of her plagues. Are you with me, friends? And it's at this time that people of the world come out. Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. This is where people begin to come out of Babylon. Why? Because what is about to happen in the third test? The third step, I should say. Not test, but the third step. Or the third stage of development. The very last stage is in the death decree. That's the final stage of the Sunday law crisis. And guess what happens at the death decree, friends? Nope. It doesn't come yet. <clears throat> That's the close of probation on the world. We're told that the death decree, there's no more martyrs. Are you with me, friends? The reason why so many people come out of the world at that time is because we've already been before prisons, many people being, being martyred, put before the kings of the world. Are you with me, friends? And many are taking a stand on the side of the third angel's message and they have their sins blotted out in the sanctuary in heaven. Are you with me? They understand what Christ is doing in the most holy place and as a result, they accept that holy law. And they accept the Sabbath as a sign of sanctification. And they take their stand upon the side of these people. Are you with me, friends? And then finally, after the martyrdoms are taking place, and who knows what that will take place, when the close of probation takes place, death decree is passed, and Jesus, in the sanctuary, without anyone knowing it or hearing it, he throws down the censer and says, He that's filthy, let him be filthy still. And at this time, though the wicked do not know it, and though the righteous do not know it, while the wicked are marching upon the people of God, they fled out of the cities, they're about to starve in the prisons. Are you with me, friends? And on a certain day, at a certain hour, in the book of Esther, a death decree is passed, that on this day, all these Sabbath keepers will be killed, and Satan is exulting, saying, I will finally rule the earth. What happens? They raise their swords to kill the righteous and it breaks like straw and, it, and a rainbow surrounds the people of God. And a voice out of heaven. Can you imagine the, the climax of history right there? And the voice begins to speak the day and the hour of Christ coming. The wicked think that it's an earthquake and thunder and the righteous face slide up with joy. And they begin to see that small black cloud the size of a hand, the man's hand in the eastern skies. And Christ comes with the trumpet sound. Brothers and sisters, this is what happens. And they've been going through Jacob's trouble during this. I'm agonizing as the people are coming, but they can't confess their sins because they can't remember them anymore. Their sins have been blotted out. And Jesus now comes. And what does he say? You have stood stiffly for my truth. Washed your robes white in my blood. Come and enter in. And the, south, the saints shout out, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! And they watch their dead loved ones break out of the dusty graves, brothers and sisters. Can you imagine? Don't you want to be there? I want to see some of my loved ones and my son to come out of that, that dusty bed and, and be winged with an angel to my wife's, to the mother's arms. The angels come down and scoop us up and have us caught up together to meet them in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Are you with me, friends? This is the grand crescendo of human history. 
And Jesus is asking us. He's asking us to walk on that narrow path. High and lifted up above the world. You know, Ellen White saw a vision. And I want to wrap this up in a minute with uh, any questions and I'll take them right afterward. I want, to, I want to get ready to pray. But you know, Ellen White saw a vision. It was her first vision. And you know, the Bible says that God illustrates the end from the beginning. I think it's fitting that at the end of Adventism, at the end of our history, God will illustrate what we need to be doing by what happened at the beginning. And that very first vision where Ellen White was around the family altar in 1844, shortly after this appointment, asking Jesus for light. Why, Lord? Why didn't you come? You know, friends, they weren't hypocrites like a lot of us are. Come, Jesus, come! And we don't really want him to come because we still want to do this, we still want to do that, and we still want to get this done, and we still want to play around with that. Blah, blah. They really loved their Savior. And they really long for Jesus to come. You know, friends, we have to get to that point. And I believe that's why God is going to allow us to go through persecution. It's going to test the metal. It's going to test what we're made of. You know, I, I, I never forget reading something in the Great Controversy. I never forgot it. Where she talks about Jacob's trouble. And she says that they have to go through it so that the earthliness can be consumed. And I'll never forget that phrase. I said, wait, what? The, the, the worldliness, right? No, 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 no. The worldliness was consumed a long time ago before the seal of God. She says the earthliness has to be consumed. You know there's a difference between worldliness and earthliness? Do you understand that? If you're in the world and worldly, you're not going to even receive the seal of God. We have to overcome worldliness and worldly lusts and worldly desires and worldly practices before the seal of God is put on our foreheads. But even after the seal of God is put on our foreheads, reflecting the image of Jesus perfectly, we're told, there's still earthliness. There's still a connection to this planet. This is all that we know. Are you with me, friends? We walk around this sin-cursed earth and we think that death is beautiful. We look at the trees dying and the creation groaning and we say, what a beautiful fall. What beautiful death. Are you with me, friends? I'm not trying to be a pessimist. I think it, it is beautiful for our, for our mortal eyes. But the point is, we're so used to sin. And God has to allow us to go through a final struggle where we finally come to the place where all earthliness, we say, Lord, I am sick and tired of this planet. Lord, I don't want to be here anymore. Lord, please come. Lord, please come. Lord, please come. I don't want to be here. Lord, please. And that's Jacob's trouble. Lord, is there anything in me? I just don't want to be here anymore. Lord, please save us. Help. Please get us off this planet. Are you with me, friends? In the vision of the narrow way, as I close, I believe it's fitting that as we're all on that narrow way and a light shining behind us, what is that light? That light is the, the midnight cry. And as long as we walk in that light and that path is high and lifted up above the world, friends, as we're walking on that narrow path, walking in that light, we're promised that Jesus will raise his glorious right arm and give us more light on our path. You know what, friends? You know what Jesus is raising his arm right now? Jesus has been raising his arm since 1989, brothers and sisters. Since the unsealing of the book of Daniel once again. He's been raising his arm, and there's been a path of Advent believers walking in that path. Walking in the light of the midnight cry, there's been some murmuring and complaining and falling off into the wicked world below. But there's others who are saying, Jesus, I can't look at my brethren. I can't look at these people. I have to look at you. And as long as they kept their eyes fixed on Jesus, we're told, who was but a short way before them, they made it safely into the city. And friends, that's our challenge today. I want to make it. Don't you want to make it? Don't you want to meet Jesus? Don't you want to be able to give him a hug? Be able to see his nail pierced hand and say, Lord, that was for me. Don't you want to make it, friends? Let's grab a hold of that prize. Amen? Let us pray. Oh, my Father in heaven, thank you for your blessed goodness. And thank you for your Holy Spirit. 
I believe that your Holy Spirit has been speaking to my heart through these lectures. And I want to accept the invitation that God is giving to me to enter into your rest. Father, I want to thank you and praise you from my heart. That you Thank you for being a good and faithful and just and true, righteous and holy God. And thank you for your awesome self-sacrifice and giving up the dearest possession that you had in all of the universe, your beloved Son. The one who was with you from eternity, who does not have any beginning nor any end. We cannot fully comprehend how you can be one with your Son in such a manner. But we thank you for giving him to us as our elder brother of the race. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for leaving heaven to die for my sins. Thank you for taking upon yourself a sinful and frail and corrupt human body. Thank you for keeping yourself pure in your mind. Thank you for never falling or sinning once, but being spotlessly pure. And yet you entered into my sufferings And you overcame them in my behalf. Father in heaven, I want to accept that gift. And I pray that my brothers and sisters here this evening would accept the gift of Christ's righteousness. And that we would accept the outstretched hand that links divinity with humanity. Lord, help us to walk on that narrow way. Help us not to look back, nor to the side, nor look at each other, but look at Jesus, at Jesus, and to make it safely to the gate of the city. As the Sabbath is now closed, as the sun is now set, as we enter into a new week, we ask and pray that the first pronounced blessing in Eden, how you blessed and sanctified that day at the end of the Sabbath, after they rested the whole time, I pray that we would receive the fullness of that blessing tonight because we need it, Lord, and we want your help through a new week. We want, don't want to slide backwards. We want to move forward. So help us to be encouraged. Help us to take your strength. And we thank you for your blessed love. Please be with us as we prepare to close, as we take our short break and come back for our final lecture. But I pray that you would seal this experience in our lives that we've been having today and allow us to never forget what you are doing for your people right now. Thank you for your blessings and goodness. And I pray, Father, for a special blessing to be upon these DVDs as well, that as you allow them to be circulated around this planet, that people be led not to any human beings, but that they will be led to the foot of the cross of Jesus and that they will be led into the most holy place of the sanctuary and that these truths might bless and transform their Christian experience. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your patience with us. And it's in Jesus' name that we ask all these things and we thank you in advance. Amen.